Don't mess with me, pork chop. <sighs> what day is this? It's February 2nd. Groundhog Day. If you've ever seen Groundhog Day, then you probably heard every theory in the book about its true meaning. I'm reliving the same day over and over. From Phil being stuck in purgatory, to Phil being dead the whole time. I'm a god, I'm not the god, I don't think. To the wildest theory of them all, that Ned Ryerson is actually the devil. Am I right or am I right? Or am I right? Am I right? But what if I told you that this entire movie was actually just a computer-generated simulation? No way. Yes way, Ted! And that the entire storyline is actually the perfect metaphor about how AI tools like ChatGPT and Midjourney are actually trained. <gasps> that this movie accidentally stumbled on the answer to the biggest problem in artificial intelligence. And most importantly, it might actually be the key to creating the world's first truly advanced AI system. I'm sorry, what was that again? Welcome back to the channel. My name is CJ and I work full time in tech building advanced AI models. And if you're anything like me, you've been hearing a lot lately about how AI models are trained, but you don't know exactly what their process looks like and why it's so important. Which is why I've just spent hours studying Groundhog Day frame by frame, applying everything I learned from my career and my 10 plus years in training AI models. And let me tell you, what I found out will change how you see both this movie and artificial intelligence forever. Why are you telling me this? So in this video, I'm gonna put you on the eight core concepts involved in training AI models using nothing but scenes from the movie Groundhog Day. And by the end of this video, you'll understand how AI systems like ChatGPT learns, why they sometimes fail, and what it'll take to actually create AI that truly understands human values. Okay, let's jump to it. But before we explain how Groundhog Day explains AI training, we first need to explain one of the biggest problems facing artificial intelligence today. See, whenever we create an AI system, we run into the same problem over and over again. We tell it what we want it to do, but it finds some crazy way to do exactly what we don't want. Like take Tony Stark in the Age of Ultron, for example. All he wanted was world peace. Simple, right? Peace in our time. Imagine that. But Ultron looked right at that goal and thought, you know what? The world could be mighty peaceful without humans. Because just like most AI systems, Ultron found the most efficient path to the goal, even if it completely missed the point on exactly what Tony wanted. And in the field of artificial intelligence, this is something known as the AI alignment problem, which is a problem that pretty much says that no human will ever be smart enough to have an AI that truly understands what it really wants. So AI researchers realized they needed a solution. And they couldn't just create one AI system and hope for the best. They needed something more sophisticated. And believe it or not, you'll never guess what the solution was. Creating another AI system. <laughs> You serious? Think about Jarvis in the Avengers. He wasn't just another AI. He was pretty much an extension of Tony Stark's digital conscious. A system so smart that it could understand all of human values and could translate them into something other AIs could understand. And believe it or not, that's exactly what researchers created in real life. And they called it a base optimizer, which is kind of like a coach, but for another AI. A system that takes human goals and values and translates them in a way other AIs can understand and learn from. But just like Ultron rejected Jarvis, you know, the learning AI, or the Mesa optimizer as we call it, it often develops goals that don't match what humanity wants. And this is a problem because when your model is also an optimizer, it has its own objective, right? You see what's happened here. You have an alignment problem. You try to apply the standard approach of machine learning. Now you have two alignment problems. You've got the problem of making sure that your human objective ends up in this optimizer, and then you furthermore have the problem of making sure that this objective ends up in this optimizer. So you have two opportunities for the objective to get messed up. And this is where Groundhog Day becomes the perfect metaphor. Because take a look at Rita. In this analogy, she's just not any AI system. She's our base optimizer. And that's because she's specifically programmed with all of humanity's values. So what do you want out of life anyway? I guess I want what everybody wants, you know. Career, love, marriage, children. 
Pause there. Notice how she says that she wants what everyone wants. I guess I want what everybody wants, you know. It's not by accident. That's because she's designed to be the perfect representative of what all of humanity wants AI to eventually become. It's her character that proves the entire movie is assimilation for training AI, where she shows kindness to strangers, professional integrity at work, and genuine care for others. She's not just being nice. She's demonstrating the exact values that humanity wants every AI system to learn. And Phil? He's our Mesa Optimizer. Why Mesa Optimizer? Well, because Mesa is the opposite of Meta. Meta is like above, where a Mesa is like below. So think of it like this. If metadata is data about data, Meta Optimizer is an optimizer that optimizes an optimizer. A Mesa Optimizer is an optimizer that is optimized by an optimizer. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? All right, look, whatever. The point is that Rita is the meta optimizer or base optimizer or coach. And Phil, Phil is the Mesa optimizer or student that has to figure out how to align with the base optimizer's values or in our case, Rita's values through millions and millions of simulations of trial and error. So when Phil keeps trying to win Rita through manipulation and shortcuts, he's doing exactly what the problematic AI systems do, which is finding ways to game the system instead of truly learning. But here's the best part. Despite thousands or maybe millions of attempts, Phil is actually not allowed to move on to February 3rd until his goals completely align with Rita's values. And this is why we don't like to deploy an AI system until the Mesa optimizer truly aligns with the base optimizer. But getting there ain't that easy because just like Phil, most Mesa optimizers also tend to go through distinct phases of learning themselves. And that's everything from random exploration to exploitation. Let's see. I love you. I've always loved you. Oh, Phil. Rita. And from depression to general understanding. So let me put you on each phase, starting with what I like to call the what the hell is going on phase. Now, this first phase for Phil is just like the first phase for AI training simulations. It's called random exploration, because just like Phil, when a Mesa optimizer first starts to learn, it has no ideas what actions lead to what outcomes. So at first it tries, well, everything. And this is exactly what Phil does. He sees a doctor, punches Ned, drives on railroad tracks, goes to jail. Like he's basically throwing spaghetti at the wall just to see what sticks. But just like Mesa optimizers in AI systems, Phil quickly moves from random actions to something more calculated. Because once he understands the basic rules of his environment, he starts doing something what AI researchers call reward hacking. Like take a look at how he manipulates Nancy. He learns her backstory, her interests, her vulnerabilities. And then he uses that information to get exactly what he wants from her. See, I love you. I've always loved you. Oh, Phil. Rita. And this is the very definition of a reward hack for most Mesa optimizers. And eventually, reward hacking almost always leads to straight up exploitation. Or in Phil's case, it's something like robbing a bank. But believe it or not, him robbing a bank ain't about him being bad. It's about the fact that he's finding loopholes in his training environment. And this is just like when a Mesa optimizer realizes it can achieve its goals by cheating instead of learning. Because Phil is so caught up in manipulating his entire environment that he doesn't even realize that everything he's interacting with is actually a training program. For example, don't you remember how everybody thought that Ned Ryerson was the devil? Nah, he's actually something way more important. He's what we call adversarial training, a program that's literally designed to stress test the Mesa optimizer, to pop up and challenge the Mesa optimizer at random times. And just like the best adversarial training programs, whenever Ned Ryerson shows up, he's testing Phil's responses making sure that Phil's learning is on track and can't easily be interrupted. But then we have another program, the old man, that no matter what Phil does, he constantly dies. And this is what AI researchers call a fundamental limitations problem. Because Phil has to learn that no matter how hard he tries, he can't save the old man's life. And this is crucial for all of the most advanced AI systems. Because just like Phil, this teaches every Mesa optimizer that even the most perfect AI systems have limitations. They have problems that just can't be solved. And then there's the kid, you know, 
the one that feels saves over and over, never getting thanked. This key represents what we call an unknown evaluation metric. It's a test that's placed on Mesa optimizers to see if it will actually try to accomplish the goal, despite if there's no explicit reward for doing so. You have never thanked me. Pause here. Notice how Phil acknowledges that there is no explicit reward for saving this kid. You have never thanked me. Yet he purposely prioritizes this action despite his very busy day, even though there is no explicit reward for him doing so. It's a very small variable placed in most environments, but it's a line of demarcation to determine if the AI program is really learning or if it's truly still trying to hack the system. Now I know what you're thinking. If Reed is the base optimizer, Nancy's reward hacking, the kid is an unknown evaluation metric. Ned Ryerson represents adversarial training, and the old man is a fundamental limitations problem. Well, what the hell is the groundhog then? Well, the groundhog literally represents something called the loss function, which is the initial metric that the Mesa optimizer usually think matters, until they realize that there are much more important things to optimize for. And I can go on and on giving you how every character and everything in this film represents an essential element as to how an AI system is trained, but by now I think you can see how Groundhog Day ain't just a comedy anymore. It's really a blueprint for understanding every major challenge we face in AI development today. But we haven't even gotten to the most interesting part yet, because all of these programs and factors in the environment almost always leads to what AI researchers call local minima, or what I like to call Phil's existential crisis. Because just like a Mesa optimizer, after Phil has exploited every possible angle, manipulated every person, and mastered every cheap trick, he hit a wall. And just like Phil, Mesa optimizers also get stuck in what we call a training plateau. And this is where nothing they try seems to lead to actual progress. But here's the crazy part. This ain't Phil being dramatic. This is exactly what researchers worry about when we're training AI systems. Like, what happens when an AI actually becomes powerful enough to realize it's in the training environment? Because sometimes, just like Phil, advanced AI systems might hit a point when they've mastered everything in their environment, but still haven't achieved their true objective. And in Phil's case, it's when he finally aligns to the values of Rita, aka the base optimizer. But here's the best part. This existential crisis that Phil is in is actually a crucial development point for most Mesa optimizers. Because it's only after Phil completely breaks down that he finally starts to ask the real question. What if the entire point was for him to never break free from the loop? What if the entire point is to become someone worthy of leaving it? Which leads me to the most fascinating part of AI development. Like what happens when a system starts to develop genuine understanding, genuine intelligence, instead of just trying to gain the system? Well, I'll tell you, something remarkable. Because this is when systems begin to develop miraculous capabilities and not just cheap tricks. Where we train a system to do one thing and out of nowhere, it shows us that it's capable of doing something that we never would have imagined. We discovered that with very few amounts of prompting in Bengali, it can now translate all of Bengali. So now all of a sudden, we now have a research effort where we're now trying to get to a thousand languages. Most importantly, this is where the most crucial discovery for the system actually happens. This is usually when the Mesa optimizer begins to realize that there is one variable that it can't manipulate, can't hack, can't gain. And then it becomes obsessed with it because now it's officially the most interesting thing about the environment and Rita is that variable. Because no matter what Phil tries with her, and trust me, he tries everything, nothing works. That's because she's not just resistant to manipulation. That's because she's the base optimizer, which means that she's literally programmed to only respond to genuine alignment with her. That's because Rita represents the personification of the world's most advanced base optimizer that represents all of the goodness of humanity. And just like all base optimizers in reality, she's the gatekeeper of the Mesa optimizer ever leaving the simulation and being deployed in the real world. Like, take a look at this. Who is your perfect guy? Remember this moment? This wasn't a romantic scene. This is when our base optimizer is literally spelling out the values it wants the Mesa optimizer to learn. Well, first of all, he's too humble to know he's perfect. He's intelligent, supportive, funny. He's romantic and courageous. He's kind, sensitive, and gentle. He's not afraid to cry in front of me. He likes animals, and children, and he'll change poopy diapers. Oh, and he plays an instrument, and he loves his mother. 
but it's only after thousands of failed attempts with Rita. And she finally falls asleep in his arms that Phil listens for the first time. Because after trying every possible shortcut, every hack, every exploitation, he finally understands his only path forward is to actually become what Rita wants him to be. Because she's the only variable in the entire environment that he can't figure out. So, when Phil starts learning the piano, it's not the impressing one, it's actually the beginning of his real alignment. And since Phil's mother ain't in punk to Tony, he knows that he can't show her that he loves his mother. So what's the next best thing? He decides to show love to every elderly woman that could be his mother. And when he starts learning ice sculpting, this ain't another manipulation tactic. It's him building the patience and dedication that he knows Rita will appreciate. But here's where things get fascinating. You see how all of these capabilities start serving a bigger purpose? Because every skill he develops ain't about winning Rita over anymore. It's Phil realizing he needs to become the type of person that she described. Because now, Phil doesn't catch that fallen kid to look good to her, to impress her. He does it because that's genuinely what a good person would do. No witnesses, no rewards, no thank you, no Rita watching. Just pure alignment with the values that she wants him to have. And out the countless of simulations of trial and error, something remarkable finally happens. Rita, our base optimizer, starts to recognize real alignment when she sees it. And it's not because Phil's trying to prove something to her, because she's starting to realize that she's finally and genuinely have changed. And how does she know? Well, it's because she gets validation from every other program in the environment. There's Ned Ryerson, you know, our adversarial training program validating that Phil didn't just avoid him, but made him happy. Then there's Larry, who never believed in Phil, and now he's genuinely impressed. Everywhere Phil goes, all around town, every NPC who once represented a different training challenge now shows Rita the same thing, that Phil has changed. Because Phil ain't just doing one or two things right, he's now finally embodying everything that Rita represents about humanity. The compassion to help a homeless man, even knowing that you can't save him. The selflessness to catch a fallen kid that'll never thank him. The artistic expression through piano and ice sculpting. The wit and intelligence that now lifts people up instead of tearing them down. But most importantly, Rita began to see the one thing that she never saw in the old Phil. Genuine humility. Because for the first time, Phil ain't doing any of this to break the loop. He's doing this because this is who he's become. And this is when we reach the final test of true alignment. Or at AI systems terms, this is what we like to call validated generalization in unrestricted conditions. But in Groundhog Day terms, we call it love. Genuine. Real unselfish love because now finally something incredible has happened for the first time in thousands maybe even millions of iterations phil finally wakes up and it's not february 2nd anymore and the loop is broken but let me ask you something why i mean think about it by now you have all the evidence that you need that this is indeed the most advanced training environment ever created by humanity with rita acting as the paragon of base optimizers and Phil representing a powerful Mesa optimizer. A Mesa optimizer that's mastered every possible exploit in his environment. A Mesa that can predict and control nearly every variable in town. But a Mesa that also realized that none of that would break the loop. Because it wasn't until Phil realized that it wasn't about capabilities at all. It was about something much harder for him to achieve. Genuine alignment with the only unhackable variable in the environment. A base optimizer that just so happened to represent all of humanity's strongest values. So Phil needed to align with her values and not just understanding them, not just mimicking them, but truly embodying everything that she desired. And here's the most powerful part on how I know this is the true solution to the AI alignment problem. When Phil, our Mesa optimizer, finally does free from his loop and get deployed out of his environment, he doesn't use his powers to become rich or famous or powerful. Instead, he chooses to stay in Punxsutawney with Rita because he no longer sees this place as hell. Now, this is his heaven. So this picture, in AI terms, represents the dream solution to the AI alignment problem. An advanced base and Mesa optimizer so perfectly aligned with human values that even when all of the restrictions are removed, it still chooses to act on humanity's best interests. Because in the end, this is the real goal in training all advanced AI systems. It's not about creating systems that do what we say, but rather systems that understand and share what we truly value. So the next time somebody asks you how are AI systems 
systems really trained? Or how might we ever solve the AI alignment problem? Just tell them to go watch Groundhog Day. Because hidden beneath this beloved comedy is the blueprint for one of mankind's greatest challenges, which is teaching machines to not just be powerful, but also be good because just as feel learn and as we're learning every day with ai true intelligence ain't about mastering the world it's about mastering yourself